Good morning and welcome back. I hope that yesterday you took the opportunity to not only listen and engage, but raise your singular voice and speak your truth as only you know it. For it's only when all the voices are giving room to be heard that we can clearly identify the gaps and more importantly, their origins and how best to bridge and ultimately eliminate them. I understand that is not always easy, but in this place, this space, you can do so with the knowledge that you are wholly supported in your journey, which is our journey to a fully realized state of diversity and inclusion. The forum not only invites us to raise up our voices, it demands that we do so. Trust me, the conversations that ensue may be tough. The subject matter unvarnished and greedy, sometimes repugnant, and vile, but it is vital that each and every voice be heard. Whether it's the voice of a middle-aged gay white male from Minnesota, or a Sri Lankan born American who grew up in Edina, or a young Muslim woman from Norway from born to immigrant parents of Punjabi Pushtan descent, or a young Indian man born in the Punjab who immigrated to the United States as a boy and now lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Or a young white man born and raised in that same city, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Here to lead the difficult yet critical discussion of how race-based hatred can rip apart the lives of innocent people and what we can and must do to help heal the deeply sown wounds inflicted by the actions of those we cannot understand, but whose voices we must hear. Please welcome executive coach and talk show host, WCCO Radio's Roshini Rajkumar. Welcome everyone. You are in for a treat today. I promise you, you're going to be shocked. You may even be outraged. But I do think when you meet these three people, you will also go away with some hope. I am so thrilled to be able to be the one leading the discussion with award-winning documentarian Dia Khan and have the privilege of meeting two of her subjects whom you will meet today. But first, let's meet Dia Khan. Dia, it's just an <clears throat> honor to be with you today. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you. You've traveled far and wide in your career, and even just to be with us this morning. The film, the documentary, you won an Emmy for it. But it's not really about the awards, is it? No. And in it fact, isn't. a little surprised by the awards? A lot surprised. It's, it's what I was just saying to you earlier as well. It's, this is such obsessive work. I'm so close to everything that I do, and I feel like the world is like this in front of me when I'm doing this work. And so then when I look up and finish the films and realize that other people form their own relationships with the films that I've made, it's, it's, it's disorienting and, and strange. And then the fact that it also then ends up receiving any kind of recognition is just, it's bizarre and it's overwhelming. Because for me, it's, it's an obsessive drive to try and understand why people do the things that they do is why I make films. So it's, it's sort of quite selfish in that sense. For people who haven't seen the documentary, tell us how a Pakistani Norwegian woman who <laughs> pretty much lives in London ends up in the United States to do a film on white supremacists. I mean, that, I never really thought <laughs> in my 24 years as a broadcaster and professional interviewer that I would say those exact words yeah. in one sitting. How did that happen? Well, I never really expected that my life would, would uh, manifest that kind of an experience either. So basically what happened is that I ended up being interviewed by the BBC. Um, and the, the topic was diversity and inclusion and our multicultural society. So I defended that in this interview, which I considered to be a fairly bland um, few statements that I made defending multiculturalism. The response that I got to that, that video ended up going viral uh, and landed on several violent uh, racist websites in America who then launched active campaigns against me to threaten me with death, 
with violence. Um, and at that point, I remember thinking, I have two ways I can deal with this. I can be afraid of this, and I can hide from it, or I can try and see if it's possible to seek out some of these people and sit with them, and if it's possible to understand where these feelings and this hatred might be coming from. If it's possible for me to sit with people like that and for them to sit with me and for us possibly somewhere in there to recognize each other's humanity. And, and would it be possible for them to hate uh, up close and personal? Um, so I wanted to get beyond the rhetoric, beyond the chest beating, beyond the, the, the hatred to the human beings behind it is, is what, I, what my, my, my desire was and obsession was at the time. And that landed you in Charlottesville? Yes. I had never heard of Charlottesville at that point. Some um, Americans have not heard of Charlottesville. Oh, really? Okay. I okay, mean, so I don't no have to feel that bad. Okay. Do we have anyone from Charlottesville here? Oh, wow. Maybe they're not admitting it. But. <laughs> Tell us what happened. So I, I, I end up at Charlottesville um, while filming one of the largest neo-Nazi organizations in America called the National Socialist Movement. Um, before that, I had done an interview with the leader of this, this group. He, now you have to understand, when, I, when it's all well and good for me to set out on this sort of mission to sit down, try and see if it's possible for me to sit with quote unquote my enemy. Um, Nobody wanted to speak to me. I reached out to every single organization and, and, and activists in this country, white supremacists in this country. Nobody wanted to speak to me. Finally, after months and months of pushing, one of the guys said yes, and that was the leader of this, this organization. And he said, look, you've got one hour. You come to this and this motel, and after that one hour, you disappear. And we sat and we spoke for about five hours, and at the end of that, he said, we're going to this rally in a few weeks at Charlottesville, and you're welcome to join us. In his name? His name is Jeff Scoop. Okay. Um, and he's the head of the largest and one of the oldest neo-Nazi organizations in, in this country. Um, so I joined them, but I also asked him at the end of those five hours, I said, look, you gave me one hour. You were quite um, aggressive about uh, upholding that arrangement. We've sat here, we've spoken for this long, and now you want me to join you. Why is that? And he said, nobody has asked me some of the questions that you've asked me. And he said, the second thing is, he said, I've come across people who ask me questions who are just trying to catch me out or who are just trying to have a hostile conversation. And he said, you also actually listened and you also told me about your life, which I'm not really used to people doing. And he said, you are very sincere in the beliefs that you hold. He said, I disagree with you and I hate the world vision that you have, which is that we should all be included, we should all, you know, we all have something to contribute and to, to play a part in our society. He said, I, I will fight against that vision. I want this country to be just a white country, but I respect your sincerity in standing by your beliefs. So anyway, so I joined them at Charlottesville, had no idea that it was going to turn violent. One of the other things also is that I was pregnant at the time, which none of these guys knew. Uh, and one of the reasons they didn't know it is because a lot of the conversations that I would hear, overhear these guys having, amongst themselves is they would talk about women of color, how they need to be forcibly sterilized, how they need to uh, be forced to have abortions so that the more uh, scum um, like me shouldn't be born and like you shouldn't be born. So I, 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 and after Charlottesville, actually, I ended up at a compound where they said I could come, it was fine, I could film, and I ended up, I wasn't actually allowed to film in the end. And there were people with bruises from earlier at Charlottesville on their bodies. They had beers in their hands and guns in their hands. And as soon as I walk down this dirt road in the middle of nowhere, they start coming towards me and start shouting at me and start cursing at me um, and waving their guns at me. And one guy said, you know, I'm going to put a effing bullet through your head. I'm going to put a bullet through your camera. Um, and also joking around saying that the best part, he had served in Iraq and, uh, and in Afghanistan, and he said the best part about uh, serving there is that I got paid to shoot and kill ragheads like you. Um, and I remember one guy came up to me smoking a cigarette and he gets this close into my face and says, are you pregnant? And I looked him dead in the eye and I said, no, I am not. Because I'm looking at my mobile phone at the same time and it says no signal. 
And at, yeah, and, and at that time, I hadn't, I hadn't told any of my colleagues back in London that I was doing this film, so nobody knew where I was. And I remember thinking, these guys can put a bullet in my head and put me in the ground now, and nobody's going to find me. Nobody's going to know. So when you watch this documentary on Netflix, remember that moment. Yeah. And the film that almost didn't get made. Yeah. Because that could have been the last day Absolutely. of your life. Absolutely. I, I honestly, I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. I, I really didn't. I want our audience to meet some of the characters. Can I get a thumbs up that our video situation is OK? All right, let's meet Brian. I would never want to say you be hurt. Um, what? What I would be doing, Dia, is ensuring the preservation of, of our race, my, my race and my nation. That's what it comes down to, and that's the only way forward. Then I would have to make sure that everyone that was ordered to do so would have to leave. Including me. Including you. And this is someone you got to know through yeah. the course of making this documentary. We'll learn later that he progressed, you progressed together. That progression wasn't just about the people you were filming. You had your own progression throughout this. Yeah. So, so this man uh, has been a committed um, soldier, he calls himself, of the white supremacist movement, of the white power movement in this country for decades. Uh, when I met him, um, he actually, he was at Charlottesville as well. Uh, when I met him, he was, he was less hostile to, to me than, than most of the other guys, and we sort of got along in, in this bizarre sort of way. And we ended up, as a result, spending a lot of time together. But he kept harping on and on and on about the white ethno state, and, and the conversation that we're having here in this clip is he keeps constantly speaking about the white ethno state that needs to um, happen in, in America. And so I asked him, I said, okay, so how do you accomplish that? What happens to people like me in your, your white ethno state? I said, you know, people like me live all over this country, so what should happen to us? Um, and I said, you know, should there be exterminations? Should, you know, people be deported? What should happen? And he said, well, you know, I wouldn't really want to see you get hurt because, you know, I, I kind of know you and I kind of like you. And when I pr pushed him on it more and said, no, but look, this is your cause. You want this white ethno state. How do you accomplish that? Uh, and he said, well, if it came down to it, yes, I would have to deport you. Even if I didn't want to, I would have Not to deport you. Not exterminate you, but deport but, but you. But I will have to deport you. So at least we got to the place where he didn't want you to die. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, That's progress. And this is what we're dealing with. This is what you're dealing with when we meet Pardeep and Arnaud, you know, two very different people that have really infected in a good way and taught each other. Yeah. And they're going to teach us today. Speaking of that white ethno state, let's meet Richard. I sat down with the new leaders of the white nationalist movement, men from privileged and elite backgrounds. We did it. We took it. We took it with force. We won. So white supremacists don't have to be skinheads or have tattoos. I mean, he's a pretty good looking guy. He looks like a lot of guys I went to college with. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what he meant about winning. So there's a, there's a real class difference within the white supremacist movement. And, and Richard Spencer and others like him, to me, represent the, the kind of elite, you know, financially well-off guys who don't really have any of the socioeconomic grievances that the boots on the ground, neo-Nazi working class guys that I ended up spending a lot of time with have. Um, for him, it's much more about power. It's much more about being relevant, being famous. Uh, having a platform to, to spew whatever it is that he wants to spew. But I think what he is spewing is actually a means to an end when it comes to his case. I think for him, it's about um, being relevant within our popular culture. And he has very cynically realized that by being hateful and by being shocking and saying some of the things that he says, it gets him the attention, it gets him the, the headlines, it gets him the news, it gets him all of that, which says something about us as a society as well, mind you, how we choose to portray these people in, in the public work that we do. Um, but. Um, it, so, so I think the class dynamic is very, very important. It was important for me to try and show People like him have cont contempt for, for, for people like me and you. But his utter contempt for working class white people within his own movement, I thought was really, really telling. 
uh, which is why it was important for me to show that. And what he's saying in this clip is that he's a natural leader. Look at me. I am successful. I am good looking. I come from good stock. I come from good family, blah, blah, blah. So I need to be a part of who will take over the reins of leadership of this imagined white ethno state that is coming. And many of them believe that this white ethno state will be accomplished through a race war. And so many of them are, are, are being as antagonistic as they are because they want to bring about this, this uh, war, race war that will ultimately lead to the white ethno state. Many of them also said that Charlottesville was just the tip of the iceberg, was just the beginning step towards this race war that is, is ultimately going to happen in their view. One thing, one side note I would like to say that I wasn't able to include in this film is one of the things that frightened me actually the most is I would say easily about 80% of the men who are part of the white supremacist movement and that are being actively targeted in their recruitment are people who have served in the military. The reason I find that so frightening is these are men who are trained, these are men who, have, who are traumatized, who have gone and seen things, who have gone and participated. And killed. In, and killed and seen horrific violence and have come back disenfranchised and broken and not being provided the, the, the right support that they need to reintegrate back into society. What this, what, extremist groups do so brilliantly and white supremacist, white supremacist groups are no different than this. I've also done work on jihadis, so there's a lot of similarities. But what they do so brilliantly is that they cynically target broken people. They are cynically recruiting and targeting men who, for example, in this case, are leaving armed conflicts and when they come back are looking for something that makes sense, something that gives them structure, something that gives them a sense of purpose, that gives them a sense of belonging and returns to them a sense of dignity. Um, so I think that is a ticking time bomb that nobody seems to be talking about in this country and these guys are training other followers within these groups in preparation for this you know, inevitable race war that is going to happen. So I, I think I wouldn't survive making that film, uh, but somebody needs to make that film because it's absolutely crucial that we look at that a bit close, closer. And it's, it's important that you note that it's not just people in this country, it's all shades and races of people around the world. Uh, I'll share an anecdote from my days as a TV reporter. So I was in Nashville, Tennessee at the CBS affiliate as a reporter when 9-11 in our country mm. hit. And the interview I had that day was at one of the universities and he was a Middle Eastern expert. And he shared with me, he said it before anybody officially deemed uh, that Al-Qaeda was behind that. He said, I think it's Al-Qaeda. And you have to understand the mentality. These are young boys that are taken. They are not given the love of, of a mother, of a woman, the, the, uh, the comforts of home. They are living in destitute situations, and they're raised militarily. And it was such an amazing assessment back in 2001. Now we get to 2019, and we're seeing this all over the world. I mean, all extremist movements prey on gaps in people's lives or gaps in our society. So if we don't have the social networks that support social, I mean, not, you know, social, not social media networks, but right. actual, you know, societal networks that provide and support people when they are at their most vulnerable, when they are at their most broken in life, there are people, and, and, and this is not just even extremist groups, any violent groups, even if you look at street gangs, it's the same thing you will have these cynical groups who will step in and actively groom and, and provide whatever it is that our young people are lacking in their lives. These groups try to fill those gaps. They're filling the gaps of the brokenness. The human, the, the, right. human, the emotional, the psychological needs that so many young people have, these groups are cynically filling those gaps. A you lot of times, religion, in fact, some call this a holy race war, religion and sexuality play into this. Hmm. Let us meet Ken. I'm not racist. I don't hate anybody. Well, I guess in that sense, like, because I absolutely despise Jews. So, yes, I'm a racist. Jews and homosexuals. They, I, I think they should be exterminated, every single one of them. <laughs> wow. When I watched the documentary originally and I heard that, I just I had a moment, right? Because 
in 2019, I don't like to hear anyone saying anyone else should be exterminated. When you are doing these interviews, how do you just stay neutral? The thing is, it's very difficult, <laughs> first of all, I have to say that. But they want me to get angry. They want me to become emotional. They want me to attack. I refuse to behave in a way that they want me to behave. The thing is, the minute they get a rise out of me, we just start clashing, we start talking past each other, and we've accomplished nothing. I will leave in a huff, he will leave in a huff. We'll all feel really good about, I have the correct opinions, I feel very self-righteous about my side, he can feel very self-righteous and good about showing some brown woman what's what, and nothing really was accomplished. I, the reason I made this film was not to confirm for myself how horrible racists are or how horrible racism is. I already know that. I, I know that. I don't need to understand what, 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 what Nazis believe. You live I it. get it. Mm -hmm. I get it. I've lived with racism, grown up with racism my entire life. So I understand that. What I don't understand is why do you think the things that you think? Who are you as a human being? What happened to you? What kind of life have you led that brought you to this point? And is there a way out of it? And if there is a way out of it, do any of us as a society play any kind of active role in that? And in the case of uh, Ken, we, again, we spent a lot of time together and he has tormented and harassed Muslims um, in, in his local area. He has you know, thrown stuff at mosques and, and, and done some really awful things. But after we spent a lot of time together, a lot of that started falling away because he sat and said to me, I consider you to be a friend. You're what, hearing that from these people you interview. Yes. The exposure to you started the road toward hopefully a conversion. Well, and, and, and that's not because there's anything special about me. The key is most of these guys feel the things that they feel and say the things that they say based on no firsthand personal experience. It's all things that they've read. It's all things that they've seen on TV. So if the only relationship you have with the other, with people who are different from you, is newspaper headlines, no wonder he thinks that I, I could possibly only be a terrorist, or I could possibly only be a victim of some kind of violence because I'm a Muslim woman. So when he was, when he then is in the vicinity of a person who is just a human being, just like him, just as flawed, just as uh, contradictory, just as confused, just as confident, just as all of those things, suddenly it doesn't make any sense. Suddenly the views that these guys held, some of them, were impossible for them to reconcile that with what they felt about me. I mean, I, as I said, when I made this film, I expected to come across horrible, horrible views. What I did not expect, I was not prepared for, was for any of them to look at me and say, I consider you to be a friend. I, as you can tell, I, I, I have a lot to say. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm never short for words, but when they said that, I, I didn't know what to say. A little dumbfounded. I was utterly dumbfounded yeah. and, and so touched. I, I, I was kind of confused and really touched at the same time. This was never a possibility that existed in my mind. I would have been offended if you would have said to me a year ago, oh dear, you're going to become friends with people like that. I would have laughed at you thinking you're crazy. And secondly, I would be offended that you would think I could be friends with somebody like that. So this like was that. part of your transformation too? It was absolutely a part of my transformation as well. It's what I realized is in the process of thinking about people like this, I in, in some way have also become like them. I have become just as hardened in my heart towards them. I have completely signed away any possibility of transformation or of redemption or of change. And the truth is change is always possible. It's always possible. And the other But we thing, can't give up on these people. We can't That's give up. And, and you will find hope in Dia's documentary. And in case you're wondering, white supremacy in this country isn't really equal opportunity. In fact, when I looked into it, I learned, at least visibly, publicly, it's 90% male. Oh, yes. 
So oh, yes. that's the kind of that's a bad stat for men. Okay, yeah. let's let's all agree <laughs> that's a bad stat for men. But one of my favorite characters, and he is a character, India's documentary is Frank because he shows us there is a pathway to hope after spending time in prison. Let's meet Frank. Frank Mink left the white power movement after spending time in prison and now spends his days working with youth at risk of extremism. He says what changed his life was when he started making friends with people of different races, people he had once thought were the enemy. Empathy is the greatest emotion because it's where we're able to turn the things that are in us, bad things that happen, bad things we've done, we're able to turn them into a positive. Empathy is such a powerful word, yeah. yet it is a subtle thing. It is. The, the, the thing is, though, empathy does not mean sympathy. It doesn't mean excusing or justifying opinions or behavior like that. It just means being willing, for me at least, it means just being willing to listen and willing to understand where someone is coming from, why someone is coming from that place. And, and what I've come to see is that empathy, if you're truly able to sit with something, some, someone with, with an open heart and, and with empathy, it's hard for them to hold on to their hatred because you are showing up as a full human being, not just as somebody who's there to point and shout and curse them out. I've done all of that. I've, I've gone to so many anti-fascist, anti-racist protests as a young person. I've, I've flipped them off, I've thrown stuff, I've shouted, I've done all of that. And none of that provided any kind of solutions. To me, it's not a matter of feeling good about myself and feeling self-righteous about winning an argument against a racist. I want there to be fewer racists. I want, their t I want racism to become reduced to such an extent that we can figure out better ways of living together. And the, th the reality is, we have to find a way to coexist. We have to, even with people that we dislike and disagree with, doesn't mean that we excuse away or normalize or accept any of, of the views that they hold. But if we deny their humanity, then in a way we are not much different than they are. And it's not just about them, I think our own humanity is at stake. How we choose to engage with hate, how we choose to react to it and respond to it, says something about us as a society and less about them. So I think it's really important that we don't lose our own principles and our own values in the process of trying to, to address this um, very, very complicated issue. That is a perfect segue for you all to meet two of the stars of Dia's documentary. Let's meet Arno and Pardeep. Wade Michael Page murdered six people, including Pardeep's father, before he turned his gun on himself. Dad uh, suffered five gunshot wounds all to the side of his body. I would want you to leave me alone with him for, you know, 10 minutes and, and really beat the shit out of him. I've hurt people horrifically with my bare hands. I, I've beaten people until I thought they were dead and I left them in a bloody mess. <laughs> Nigger, prepare to burn. You've attacked our people, and now it's your turn. At the same time, I would want to understand why. Because something is fueling it. I, I preyed upon their trauma and their suffering to, to manipulate them, to hate people, and to hurt people. What is it that fuels you to do that? After the murder, Pardeep did a remarkable thing. He reached out to a former neo-Nazi to search for answers. <laughs> so, <laughs> Arno Michaelis. For, for me, um, why, why I reached out to Arno because I wanted an explanation. More important than that, I, you know, I, I, got, I gained a brother, I gained, I gained a friend, uh, and I gained someone that was going to say, you know what, I'll not only tell you what happened and why it happened, but I'll walk with you and we can explain it to other people, too. 
Pardeep, how can we look at this guy here, Arno, to your right, after hearing what he said, and you say, I gained a brother, I gained a friend? Explain that to us. Sure. Uh, and uh, I, I can say that because sometimes within our healing journeys, we reach out and we want, to, we want explanations. And what I gained was really an experience. And the experience wasn't as much about what, uh, what happened to me, but what we can do going forward. And uh, it was, I didn't know at the time that it was really going to be the, the, the day that I met somebody who would be able to inspire me to say, you know what, at this point, you got two choices. And then it really does come down to accepting that we had the choice. And forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness uh, toward, not, not saying that it's, you condone what happened to you, not to say, you know what, it's OK, but that you have the ability to gain freedom and to live a life that you can be there for your, for your wife, for your children, for your community, um, and you can be productive. And the choice really becomes, are you going to become bitter or better? And we obviously know that if you want to become better, you have to first and foremost change the I. I didn't know that. I started to, I started to after the shooting happened, uh, really engage in community and, and do the best I could on gun legislation, uh, Islamophobia, the narrative, and things like that. But I didn't know how much of my own personal healing needed to happen to be a productive person within community. And, uh, and that's why I can say I gained a brother. And to clarify, yeah. because both of you live in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. he was not responsible for your father's death directly. How no, would you? No, he wasn't direct, Arnold, Arnold wasn't directly responsible for my father's death. Um, Wade Michael Page, who was, as we talked about, he was an ex-military vet. Uh, he was involved in the same movement uh, that Arnold helped to found. Um, so in a way, he was responsible. And I think what I loved about Arnold was his ability to say, you know what, I'm not shying back from that responsibility. And he basically raised his hand and said, you know what, take out on me as much as you want to take out on me. Be mad, be mad at me. And even in moments of private, um, when, when there is a bit of anger and angst and, and, and frustration at what is happening, when, when we hear about the, the, the last shooting, there's obviously frustration because you're like, all this work that we're doing is for not. You feel like that. And so in moments of private, you know, he allows me to lash out and says, OK, how are you feeling now? And that's, that's really a brother. And, and that is a gift. That is a gift. And the two of you co-wrote The Gift of Our Wounds. We did. They go around the country now together, talking to groups, students, adults, to try to break the chain. Arno, you were in a band. You were spewing hate to music, to words. We saw the video. That's a very poignant piece of film when you share the violence. What went on in your brain to turn this around to get you not only to the friendship with Pardeep and to be in the film with Dia, but to be here with us today to share this so openly? Looking back, and basically what Pardeep and I do now and what I do for a living is like Monday morning psychoanalysis. Looking back at my childhood, looking back at my teen years, going, what, what was wrong with this kid? At the time, I, I wasn't aware of any of this. But looking back, I think I just really didn't love myself. And you, you can't love the world around you if you don't love yourself. So that being said, even when I got involved in the neo-Nazi skinhead movement, I knew what I was doing was wrong from the get-go. And I had this inner knowledge of my wrongness that I was constantly trying to suppress. I didn't want to acknowledge that voice asking me what I was doing, much less answer it. And that took a ton of energy. Um, th that exhaustion combined with the exhaustion of cutting myself off from the rest of society, which is what you have to do to maintain such a hateful fundamentalist mindset, uh, was driven home most actually when people I claim to hate treated me with kindness. So that's why uh, Dia is such a hero to me. I, I want to be Dia when I grow up, uh, for one. So do I. <laughs> because it was, it was people with that kind of bravery who refused to let me dictate the, the rules of engagement. I'm curious, when Dia was there right in front of you, this is back a few years now, 
were you just like, who is this chick? Why is she asking me this stuff? I mean, I, I would have just loved to have been a fly on the wall during, during those conversations. No, I, I had known about Dia long before we met in person. And uh, I, it, just to give a timeline, I went public with my story on the MLK holiday of 2010. So by the time August 5th, 2012 rolled around, I had been very busy as a peace activist, primarily working in the inner city of Milwaukee. So you were able, to, you were at a place where you could talk about this. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. also have that self-awareness and reflection to openly share with Dia. Yeah, that, that, that time was a big asset for me. And, and that's a really important thing to understand. If we're looking at people like Bruce, we're talking about Ken, they've made these changes like very, very recently. I, I made them going on three decades ago. Mm -hmm. So time is a big factor in getting from there to there. Mm -hmm. And a daughter was a big factor. Absolutely. Uh, my daughter is 26 I love how your now. face softens. <laughs> that's so beautiful. <laughs> My, I, my life has revolved around my daughter for the past 26 years, and she was 18 months old when uh, her mother and I broke up. G go figure, but hate and violence and alcohol is not a recipe for a healthy relationship between a man and a woman. <laughs> that should be on a bumper sticker. If you don't take anything else <laughs> off from this whole conference, like that you could rely on for sure. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that they can't have a little fun at the cocktail reception during, yeah, exactly. during the conference. Any yeah. one of those, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the alcohol is the only one that can be safely indulged in and responsibly. But um, yeah, my, my daughter was a, a huge factor in my turnaround and uh, she saved my life. And, and every day now I'm grateful for the life that I lead, uh, grateful to friends like Dia and Party for making it so rich, and uh, grateful to my daughter for giving me that reason to keep living. You know, we were in the back room and we we're talking about, uh, so Arnold's daughter, she, my oldest daughter, and then your oldest daughter. We've all had <laughs> oldest daughter first. Yeah. And they do change your life and they save yeah. your life. And then, you. I, remember, I think back to the day of the shooting, and it was only because <clears throat> I made my daughter a priority to go back and that, that's what saved our lives. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger extent, like how much our daughters save our lives. Yeah, mm. it's true. There's a common theme. It that really should is. also be on a bumper sticker. It really is. It's so true. Dia, both Arnaud and Pardeep talk about cultural agility, and that's something they're talking about all over the country now. You can see them, just look them up on their website and book them. Uh, the bottom line is, though, you had to deal with a lot of different cultures and mindsets when you were making this film, when you've made your past film. How does that cultural identity term fit into maybe some of the lessons you want all of us to have? Cultural agility. I don't actually know what cultural agility means. I'll, you, you two say it so eloquently, so yeah. I'll let you just define so, it for her. So for, for the DNI crowd, for you guys, <laughs> cultural agility is basically... These are your peeps. <laughs> yeah. yeah this is, so it's, the, it's basically embracing a culture to the point that you become productive, not just tolerating, mm. but, but building a culture, a corporate culture, or even a broad-based social fabric culture okay. where we start to say, you know what, we embrace the uniqueness that you bring in because that is actually what gives our corporation strength. And, and it sounds easy enough, but oftentimes, whether you're in education, whether you're uh, working, uh, or whether, whether it's broad-based society, you really have to deliberately get to a place where you start to like, change up the way that it looks, the way that you guys do interviews, the way that, uh, like, what books are allowed into a curriculum. Well, you know, so a lot of it is a very uh, uh, deliberate cultural shift. I, I like to define cultural ag agility as not just knowing that uh, making your business decisions at cocktail hour on Friday is like pretty much exclusive of your Muslim employees. But to me, cultural agility is knowing to go around your Muslim homie's house at <laughs> sundown on, during Ramadan mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. iftar is coming mm -hmm. and you're gonna have some great biryani. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> which is amazing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cultural agility is like to the point where you're not just like, oh, let's accommodate the Muslims. Cultural ability, agility is like, this is awesome. Yes. Hey, it's Ramadan and, and sun's sinking. So now it's time to go have biryani at our yeah. friend's house. Like yes. that, that enjoying and really feeling connected to that culture rather than uh, othering it or rather than being intimidated by it. I mean, I just, I just think that, you know, the time that we're living in, not just in America, but also across Europe, you're seeing the same trends. I mean, I think there's a politics of resentment and a politics of dis division that is being uh, encouraged 
and promoted by so many of our political leaders. And I think that the problem with that is that the culture that that is now promoting is that it is giving permission to hate and giving permission to othering uh, people in a way that I think used to be unacceptable even a couple of decades ago. And I think what really frustrates me is that on a political level, you know, we now have, you know, we have people from all over the world sort of plopped together in, in, in different communities, just expected to live together, expected to do well, and, and that's that. Um, and the, the reality is integration or living together is difficult. It's, it's just like a human relationship. It's difficult to live in relationships that we choose to be in. People that we like, it's difficult to be in a relationship with. But the difference is that in, in relationships that we choose to be in, we've made a commitment to each other that we will make this work. And we are in this even in the difficult times, uh, not just the great times. So therefore, when we come, come up against hurdles, we are willing to invest the time and the passion and the love that requires to make that relationship work on a societal level. And, and, and I don't know about the corporate side of it, but on a societal level, we have not made that commitment to each other. We haven't made this deep connection and commitment to the fact that we have to find a way to coexist. We have to. And the neo-Nazis that I met with, they occupy the same streets and the same space that I do. How, so how do we think our way through finding solutions to how we make this relationship work? because we have no choice and it has to be peaceful. If we don't make this work, the alternative is violence. So I think, you know, from my personal experience with these guys is just human connection and interaction is absolutely crucial, just like with any other relationship and a commitment to want to make it work, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's not convenient, even when it's unpleasant and difficult. We have, to, we have to be there with each other. And we cannot, I can't say this enough, we must not give up on each other. Most of these guys have given up on themselves and they've most certainly given up on us. So we can't afford to do the same in return. And the human connection is so important and that connection or interplay or sometimes clash between the head and the heart. Mm -hmm. And that really was in our faces earlier in the week when we learned Notre Dame was burning. Mm -hmm. It was amazing, the reaction on social media. Yeah. And I found out about it on social <clears throat> media. I went and looked it up, I posted it on Facebook, and I said, I don't, religion or no religion, let's pray. Mm -hmm. And everyone has some sort of connection to these kinds of things. I happened to have studied in Paris for a semester during junior year. I went to mass many times in Notre Dame. So that was my little, small, tiny connection but it hit me on a heart mm. level. Yeah. Arno, let's talk about the head and the heart. What's your advice for people? Uh, you have to have a balance. Um, each plays a very important role. Uh, I, I think to me what's really important in striking that balance is just understanding that there's all sorts of trauma involved. And that uh, everybody in this conversation, whether we're talking about a perpetrator of hate or a target of hate, Everyone is going through trauma, and our heads have to remind our hearts that. Because our hearts can make us very passionate. And uh, I'm a Buddhist, so to me, it's, and it's a weird thing for someone in the West to say, but like in Buddhism, passion is not a good thing. Passion is what derails us from being compassionate. Uh, so kind of like the, the fusion Western blend of this is like ground your passion in compassion. And you need to be mindful in order to do that. So that when you're seeing a situation of conflict, you're, you're witnessing all of the trauma that's involved with all parties, rather than just the trauma of the person you're sympathetic to, and then shutting the door to the person you're not sympathetic to. Mm. Mm. The uh, you know, heart and mind. And oftentimes, there's, a, there's another element, which is the spirit. And if sometimes the heart you know, can, be, can deceive. The mm -hmm. mind can be melodramatic. Mm -hmm. But if you're in tune with your consciousness and your soul, you know, so everybody right now, if, let's, just, let's just try this. Everyone right now, all right, please just, just do me this. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes. And in your spirit, 
not out loud, just say the word love on three, in your spirit. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. Now, please open your eyes. And you know that everybody around you, that is what connects every one of you. That is what will always connect every one of you. That wasn't in your heart, that wasn't in your mind, that was in your spirit. And if we fundamentally know that is the truth, how can you be disconnected mm. by race, by religion, by socioeconomic conditions? Not to say those things are not important. Our uniqueness makes us beautiful. <clears throat> but fundamentally, when we talk, when Sikhi is like saying, become one, become ik, right? They're saying, they're not just saying become one with somebody outside of you, they're saying become one with yourself, first and foremost. Connect mind, body, spirit, and then you can become one with somebody else. That's beautiful. Mm. Did you, Dia, when you were talking to all of these different, mostly men, did you find that you could visibly see a clash going on there between the head and the heart? Mm. Yes, yes. Describe that. I could see in their eyes, in their physical demeanor, how they were very controlled, they were very tight when we would first start speaking together. And as we would share, they, I would ask them about their experiences, their life. You're talking about you know, connection, you know, Notre Dame really touching your heart. For me, I was constantly looking for, I know where we're different. Where can I find something where we might be able to bond, where he might be able to hear me, where I may, might be able to really hear him. So I would constantly be looking for that. And whenever we would connect on you know, whatever it was, you would see their body loosening up. You would see their eyes brightening and warming up. And by the end of our conversation, with most of them, of, of course not all of them, because not everyone wanted to eventually go into that space, you would, you would see them behaving and sitting and talking and feeling and expressing like a completely different person. The warmth that they had, the, comf the, the kind of comfort that they had in their body was completely different. Um, and I mean, th this word love, everything that I do is centered in that. And, and that's difficult for me to say as a filmmaker because I'm supposed to you know, be distant and all of this and all of that. And, how, and also, a lot of these business people in the room, I mean, I don't know a lot of chief human resource officers who can be like, all right, folks, let's talk about love. Like, I just don't see that but, happening but, but, but in a really, lot of American companies. But really, really, if you think about it, and, and I'm really so pleased that you brought this up, that truly is where all of this centers. It's the, either the lack of or in the need for love. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, isn't it MLK that said, you know, it's, it's not, you, you, we cannot drive out hate with more hate. Yeah, only love can do that. And, and I've always loved that saying. I've always been so inspired by it. But having been able to be in a space with people who walk in the room with such hatred and such hardened hearts, and to see that melt away in front of my eyes just because I was willing to listen, just because I was willing to put all of my emotional baggage at the door, which doesn't mean that my anger and my frustration doesn't have its place and that it's not justified, it absolutely is. But that doesn't make us connect to each other. We can get to that part as well, but first I have to make it possible for him to hear me. And the only way I can do that is by being fully human in front of him and to be gentle and warm and open and compassionate and empathetic with him. And then once I would do that, then I would also read out loud to them all the threats that I'd gotten, all the words that people like them have used about me. And then I would see in their eyes and in their face, they didn't like it. And they even said it. They were visibly uncomfortable, and then some of them would even say it. Oh, don't use words like that about yourself. And, I, and, and it makes me kind of laugh, going, none of these words are new words to you. You use this type of derogatory language about people like me every single day. 
yet you're uncomfortable because they cannot reconcile what they're feeling about me and what they know that they should think about people like me. Because again, the headlines tell them something else and what they're feeling and what they're experiencing is something completely different. And that also applies to me. What I know about these guys is also they are these monstrous, horrible, hardened, violent, horrific guys. And then I'm sitting there and I'm seeing this incredible, gentle, vulnerable, insecure guy trying to tell me something. You know, so how can I be hateful in response to that? How can I be aggressive and judgmental and patronizing in, in, in response to that? I want to say to the audience, if you have any questions for our panel in our remaining minutes, text in or tweet in whatever you've been instructed to do, and I'll see those questions here on my tablet. Uh, a, lot of t a lot of people in this audience may be looking at the three of you and saying, oh, okay, you, you all have these dramatic stories. <laughs> Arno, you know, you were tattooed and great abs, by the way, back in the band days. <laughs> back in the uh, day, had to she say says, it. Yeah. Don't way come back. after me, had to say it. Um, you know, spewing the hate. Pardeep, you lost your father in a very dramatic way. You were in fear of your life throughout much of the making of this latest documentary. But, you know, I'm just a Lutheran from Botswana, and I work at Target and I've got a Catholic Sri Lankan in the next cubicle. I can't relate to you three, because you just like, this is dramatic. What do you say to those people? Mm. Um, you know, it, it does seem dramatic. Um, and I, I think, you know, our, our heroes and sheroes are really those that are every day living the life of this, uh, saying, okay, you know what? I need to be committed to this growth, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a school, whether it's just your own children or some, somewhere else. But uh, I think we've been inundated with stories of everyday sort of life and forgiveness and how, how do you move on with your life when something tragic happens to you? And I, I would never wish you anything like this, um, but there's probably something that's gonna happen in your life that's gonna, that's gonna call on you to say, what do I do now? Do I really have a choice? Is there a choice for me to make? And, and, and you do. And uh, since we've come out with our book, The Gift of Our Wounds, I, I think people have shared and, and shared say, saying, okay, this is what happened to me, whether it's like a cab ride or somewhere else, of what's your book about? Oh, it's finding the gift in our wounds. How do you do that? Uh, and this is what happened to me. And as, as we share our stories, we automatically form connection. So when we think about corporations and corporations not having maybe the culture of saying, you know what, we can talk about love, you can talk about connection. And, and because that's the truth. The truth is, it's not, it's, not, it's not how much you make, it's not what position you're gonna have for the next 20 years, it's not some of the things that we believe are, are all coping mechanisms are control mechanisms. And sometimes we think that we can control this and this and that. But the truth is not never really being discussed. The truth of, I don't feel so good right now. I feel really, I feel hurt. I feel like somehow that demeaned my being because of what they said or what they didn't say or what they didn't understand mm -hmm. or what they judged about you rather than understand. Those are the conversations that we need to have in corporate culture. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're having those, those conversations, then somebody brings their full self to work. And if they can bring their full self to work, they won't be as likely to say, you know what, you didn't accept the best of me because you rejected me for this promotion. Mm -hmm. They're saying, I brought all of me, you accepted some of me, maybe the job wasn't right for me to take, and then we build a healthier society because now we understand people's complete self. So embrace, not embrace. just tolerate. Oh yeah. And I'd like to think if Pardeep and Arno, knowing what we know about their past and who they are, can come together and feel like brothers and write a book together, which by the way is on sale in the marketplace and Pardeep, Pardeep is happy to sign your copy, I would like to think if you two can do what you've done, any of us can get over anything. It just isn't that bad. We can get over it. Arno, yeah. I want to know what Pardeep has meant to you in your life. Pardeep has been uh, such a guide for me to really like appreciate what's best in life, and, but also a model. I think. Modeling the behavior we want to see in others is super important, and, and this guy is a model 
of responsibilities, a model of hard work. Uh, to me, maybe most importantly, he's a model of like wackiness. <laughs> we have more fun together than I It is important. It should be legal Laughter is right up there with um, love. We've, we've been on the way to gigs where we had to like stop and get ourselves together. Because, because you were we laughing. were laughing so hard. Okay, no, stop it. We got to go talk about hate crimes now. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's really like awe inspiring to me on a daily basis how much fun we have, but also how genuine he is. And yeah. Amazing father, amazing therapist, amazing son, husband, citizen. Uh, I'm, I'm a very lucky guy to hang around party and, and Dia. Dia, what yeah. have. Uh, just the time you've had with these two and also what the film and their part in it, what do they mean to you? Oh, wow. It was fun watching the three of you reunite this morning after <laughs> not seeing each other for a while. Yeah. You know, um, getting to meet both of you, and I, I met Arno first, and I was so touched by his story and his willingness to be so open and honest about everything that he's gone through and his incredible wisdom and self-reflection. Um, but meeting both of you, I mean, I get goosebumps just even thinking about that, but it gives me hope. And it confirms to me what I know to be true in my gut, in my heart, which is it is just about love. It is just about compassion. It is just about empathy. It is just that easy and just that difficult. And the two of you, to me, exemplify what is possible. You exemplify incredible, incredible suffering and pain and loss and devastation, but also the capacity that we as human beings not only have of inflicting that on each other, but the capacity we have to change and to reconnect to ourselves and to each other and that something better is possible. Oh. You, you to prove that to me. And anytime I lose faith in that and lose kind of touch with that, all I do is I think about the two of you and I know it's going to be okay. And that's not, you know, I don't want people to think, oh. Yeah, that's <laughs> Can I just say, I don't want to underplay the danger of movements like this and, and the capacity for it to cause incredible carnage. So I, I, I'm not suggesting that we just need to go hug a Nazi and things will be okay, <laughs> right? But, not, not a bumper sticker. Right, no. right. Well, um, all I'm saying is it's not just their humanity that is at stake here. Ours is at stake as well. So we have to remember ourselves to be human. And we have to show up, as you say, as our full selves. And we have to be willing to be in this together and to figure out a way through this. Um, there's no escaping this. But we have, to me, love is not sentimental and mushy and, and any of that. To me, it's actually really strategic. Yeah. And it's practical and it's effective. So I, I think um, we have to be willing to reach out to each other. I cannot stress that enough. Love, hope, and humanity, these three really do live it. And it is possible for breakthroughs, no matter where you are on this journey. I absolutely despise Jews. So yes, I'm a racist. Jews and homosexuals. They, I, I think they should be exterminated, every single one of them. <laughs> I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors from Germany. The idea of meeting Ken has given me hope. It gives me hope. Frank Mink left the white power movement after spending time in prison and now spends his days working with youth at risk of extremism. He says what changed his life was when he started making friends with people of different races, people he had once thought were the enemy. Empathy is the greatest emotion because it's where we're able to turn the things that are in us, bad things that happen, bad things we've done, we're able to turn them into a positive. Only did bother me. You know, at the human level, 
uh, you know, to hear some of the comments and things that were made to you. And, you know, this did play into my decision to go ahead and retire from, you know, operations. I'm ashamed of all the kids I've led astray. Till the day I die, I'll, I'll be ashamed of that.